Good morning. Go ahead and get started with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission regular meeting. It is September 7th, Thursday, 2023, 9.02 a.m. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Peterson. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Montesino. Here. Commissioner Hernandez. Present. Commissioner uh, Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Alternate Quinn. Here. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Here. Commissioner Pegler. Here. And Commissioner Rotkin. Here. And Commissioner. Oh, oh no. I'm going to miss so you. Olenek. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, we have a quorum. Uh, are we, is uh, Commissioner Peterson online or does it have a just cause request? Do we have a, any AB 2449 just cause request? I'm wondering if uh, Commissioner Peterson, who was not here in person, might be online. Uh, and uh, Director Preston, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda today? No additions or deletions. However, we do have a few handouts. We have a handout for item 24. Um, that's a staff report. We also have handouts for items 16 and 23. Thank you. I'll proceed with oral communications. Any member of the public may address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not already on the agenda. The commission will listen to all communication, but in compliance with state law, may not take action on items that are not on the agenda. Speakers are requested to state their names clearly so that it can be accurately reported in the minutes of the meeting. Uh, Aaron Chambers wants to address the commission. We have a mic for you over here at the podium. Seeing no one, is there anyone online? Yes, we have a few hands raised. Um, Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian Peoples for Trail Mail. Um, I think Carrie Pico is going to make a statement, and I just wanted to thank Carrie on the great work he has done for our community and identifying the details of the legality of the coastal corridor with private properties. He's done some phenomenal work, and I'm hopeful that this commission really respects and listens to what he says. Historically, this commission hasn't listened to the experts. Uh, case in point, we didn't listen to uh, Executive Director Guy Preston over the years where he was recommending the Chump Trail. So I'm hopeful that we begin to do that. And then I do want to take a moment to talk to item number 23 because I won't be able to attend and I'll just make a comment that that um, the cost of the segment five, the North Coast Trail, is it a great example of how in the old tracks there is preventing the use of that corridor. And it's uh, very sh hurtful for our community not to be able to use it. We've only built 1.2 miles of the trail over a decade. And, and that delay on segment five is going to continue because what the Coastal Commission did is they've only given us a temporary uh, retaining wall, which I do not believe was contained we'll have to replace that and it's not in the, the cost analysis. I'm not sure, but I would suggest that you double check that, that you'd have to remove that in the future. But again, I just want to thank Kerry again for his phenomenal work. And I'm hopeful that the coastal commission um, listens or the RTC listens to his expertise. Thank you for your time. Hi, uh, this is Kerry Pico. Can everybody hear me? Hello? Hello? Can anybody hear me? I can hear you, Kerry. Okay. Anybody else in the audience? <laughs> is we can hear you, Carrie. Okay, that's that's what I want to hear. So here I'm starting out, and I'm going to make it very quickly. Um, there are miles 
between the boardwalk and Watsonville of the rail corridor that is not exempt from our, I mean, that the RTC does not have full ownership over. And I'm just going to go quickly. Um, I was gonna, I didn't expect to have a presentation this time because I'd forgotten to send it in. Uh, property taken by condemnation by a private company, deeds with a granting clause that states conditions. And uh, you should know that a trail on the railroad easement requires compensation to the owners. Next slide, if you could. I'm going to zip through. So next slide, just click on, yeah, there we go. So this is California, you know, you guys, I'll just say it, property taken by condemnation, which is miles through um, Live Oak and Capitola. Um, there, yeah, just leave it there. There's an example of it is further order that certain parcel land is taken and look at the very bottom is hereby condemned. And so there's many, many properties in in particular the Live Oak uh, Capitola area of that. Next slide, please. Um, also, if the courts have, have stated that if you have a condition inside the grant agreement, in, uh, in the grant clause of uh, deed, that um situation is uh respected by the courts as a an easement anyway so what i'm trying to say is that there are numerous properties i've been contacted by property owners asking what should they do and i look at their deeds and they have conditions within the granting clause it says it's a right of way and large portions of aptos uh, soquel area or capitola um is it so uh, i'd rather not see people get picked off one by one which is what's going to happen but you may have a large line lawsuit by uh, uh you know breaking the the right of way yeah thanks for starting before i even heard that anybody wanted this Hi, um, I'm Rick Longinati with the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. And I wanted to suggest uh, a future agenda item. Um, this would uh, be an idea to add value to the auxiliary lanes that are under construction. Uh, we know that the auxiliary lanes, you know, in between uh, 41st Avenue and State Park Drive, some of them are long as long as uh, a mile and a mile and a half. And when the when the road is congested, say in the evening commute, we know that uh, you know motorists are going to uh, move into the auxiliary lane, and it, even though they need to weave back into the through lanes to get to their destination, and that weaving is going to cause congestion. And we see that already with the last auxiliary lane that was built um, between SoCal Drive and Forty First. I mean, between Morrissey and SoCal, which is quite congested in the evening commute. So. Uh, in order to avoid that and actually um, allow buses to have a, a bit more um, space in the auxiliary lane to, to, to make some headway, um, some signage, perhaps some paint, uh, you know, the, 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 to, to really get the point across to the motorists that these lanes are for exiting the highway and not for weaving into and weaving back out of at the next interchange. And uh, I really appreciate if you put that on your agenda. And in the meantime, check with Caltrans about what would be the optimal strategy, whether it's uh, a red paint uh, on the lane or perhaps uh, just a thick uh, stripe in between the auxiliary lanes and the through lanes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Longinati. Mr. Michael Sain. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Koenig. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Michael St. was CFST. Uh, on August 26, CFST hosted a transportation justice conference with over 50 guests in attendance. After Rick Longinati's opening statements, uh, which emphasized the futility of highway widening and the Ox Lanes project, we did not mention highway widening again or Ox Lanes the rest of the day. You might ask yourself, why not? Well, the purpose of our conference was to educate and focus pro on projects that will provide our county with sustainable, non-polluting, 
and a non-automobile eccentric transportation system while providing benefits for our disadvantaged communities. Our present Oxlane hybrid bus system that is projected in the future does not uh, count any of those as part of their benefits. I would like to thank the following speakers and attendees for being part of our conference. Michael Tree, Santa Cruz Metro CEO, uh, Lonnie Faulkner, Equity Transit, and also candidate for first district supervisor, Linda, Linda Marin from Citizens Climate Lobby, Sally Arnold, former board chair of Fort, and specifically for attending Commissioner Kristen Brown, also Capital Vice Mayor, Capitola Vice Mayor and District 2 Supervisor Candidate, uh, and especially RTC Commissioner and Supervisor Felipe Hernandez for participating as a panel member during the conference. Thanks to all for making this a great conference. Real quickly, I'd like to thank uh, Commissioner Rodkin, uh, last meeting on August 3rd for questioning the staff during the uh, RTC meeting about agenda item 28, which was called for projects. Commissioner Rodkin's concern was that the list of projects gave little concern for our climate change crisis, which appears to be getting worse every year. Thank you for your time and all your hard work on the commission and uh, have a good morning. Thank you. We have a former chair of this commission, Aurelio Gonzalez. Hi, here. Hi, good morning. Um, I just wanted to say uh, uh, thank uh, President Guy for his service to the RTC. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it there in person. Uh, but um, again, I just take this moment just to, to thank him, thank his staff, uh, his leadership. Uh, and moving forward with transportation uh, needs for the region. Uh, and thank you for your time. Tell us. No other hand online or anyone else here in chambers will lead with items five through 18, which is the consent agenda. Any have comments or questions on this? Brown. Thank you, Chair Koenig. I have a few questions on item eight. This is the uh, rejection of a bid for repairs. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm, I'm, I understand the rationale and I um, am also concerned that the work is continuing to be delayed, um, that the it's likely that the cost for this work is going to continue to rise. So I don't know that delaying is going to necessarily get us a, a cheaper bid um, and uh, potentially compound because the longer we go, um, obviously there's going to be more to resolve. So um, I'm just, just wondering in terms of, um, I, I again understand the rationale for today, but in terms of how we move forward to uh, try to figure out how to get this work done, at least the, the crucial parts, um, to avoid additional, um, you know, disrepair, um, more costly disrepair. It would just be helpful to hear, um, you know, what your what the thinking is for how we proceed. You bring up some very valid concerns. Um, these are things that we discussed about in depth. Um, we um, rejected the bids last time. Um, I want to um, be bid again and got a higher bid. So it didn't work in that particular instance. Um, we've queried um, our contractors as to why they did not bid to the very time restriction. We think with more competition, we'll get more. So we talked in depth about the, you know, the various locations and um, why we feel we might need to go this year on um, some locations versus others. And there's really one location that we are most concerned about. And it's a location between about San Andreas Road and Manresa Beach, um, not accessible from the road. A um, bridge, very low clearance. The silt has built up uh, almost the profit of the bridge right up. Um, if 
we were to get an early storm and that area was um, receive a lot of water, we're worried that that could wash out. So our plan is to um, did that as an emergency contract. Um, there's more flexibility with that. Uh, um, there would only be one location that the contractor would need to finish in a tight time frame. Um, and we believe we'll get multiple bids for that location that would satisfy our immediate. We think with the other location having more time and more flexibility. Also, with um, the rail, uh, Measure D rail funding, uh, not being trained, not having received all of the approvals from for all of the locations, we're worried about our ability to get reimbursed for all of the locations and without doing that for sure, getting the cost down in our best interest. So um, after having this deliberation, we came up with this plan. And we'll, get, we'll get this one location done this year and in a loss, less costly manner. We also feel that one location that we will get done this year that will get more cost. Likely. The contractor that has been bidding on it the last time, not have experience working with all of in at least of for access, that's part of it. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I, I saw it reflected in the agenda report, the um, kind of multiple bids question, and it's good to hear that you those conversations led you to that conclusion. Um, and I've taken that ride with you, and so I know that, that uh, site, and I appreciate hearing that you're focused on the most critical pieces. So yeah, it just feels like uh, with the, a bit estimates that um, or projections where um, I mean this is a something that public it happens with public agencies all the time and it's a dilemma because we have a limited amount of funding um, and most bids come in over but to kind of have this experience twice now is disconcerting so just wanted to check thanks it's disconcerting for us too as I imagine it was yeah thank you Mr. Brown there are comments or questions for commissioners about the consent agenda? Seeing none, any member of the public wish to comment on the consent agenda? Online from mm -hmm. Mr. Michael Saint. Sorry, and I see a second comment. Barry Scott will be next. Commissioner um, Koenig, it looks like the folks on Zoom are having a hard time hearing all of us who are not speaking directly into the mic. So if we can do that, please. Uh, Saint, if you'd like to comment on the consent agenda, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Chair Koenig. Uh, yeah, item seven, um, which is the uh, final design work on Highway 1 uh, to Freedom Auxiliary Lanes. Uh, CFST feels you are risking $300,000 by doing design work before completion of the EIR. Also, the draft EIR is seriously deficient. There is significant doubt as to a final EIR can be, become a valid document. This project is tiered from the HOV project back from 2019. This EIR has been set aside and invalidated by the courts. Also, an EIR tiered from an invalid EIR, which is happening presently, is considered inval not valid. CEQA, as of July 2020, requires highway expansion projects to be analyzed for their VMT and be mitigated if it increases VMT. It's not being done. Although you advertise reducing congestion, the draft EIR concludes that the congestion northbound will actually worsen, according to the draft EIR, and the southbound congestion relief will be short-lived. CFST requests that you decline to authorize this expenditure of the taxpayer money on a project that is seriously problematic. Thank you. Mr. Sain, Mr. Barry Scott. Uh, good morning, commissioners, and uh, thank you for, uh, for always having these meetings available by Zoom. I'm, uh, I wanted to speak to item eight, the uh, rejecting a bid that uh, that came back higher, and uh, I think it would be helpful if the reports 
in the agenda and to the commissioners included an explanation of why it, this bid came back higher the second time around. Uh, more, more importantly, um, it's a recurring theme that the 8% of Measure D is inadequate to do all the work that we'd like to do. And I remember, and some of you will too, that it started out at 15%, was knocked down to 14%, and then all the way down to 8%. And uh, whether we like that or not, that's unfortunate. Uh, obviously, we need more money than the 8% provides. Uh, interestingly, 17% is for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. 17% uh, plus 8%, 25% of Measure D funds are for that corridor in one form or another. And I think uh, to avoid perpetual, we don't have the money because of 8%, to avoid that, I think we need to start thinking of the rail corridor property as the work site for the trail and be willing to move funds from the 17% active transportation bucket to make up for shortfalls when rail corridor work like this is needed. I'm disappointed that we're going to take the risk of another winter storm series coming through. And I pray that what work is done is adequate to survive the storms. But next year, we're going to need to figure out how to fund all the work that needs to be done to protect both the rail project and the coastal rail trail. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Scott. Of course, we'll be discussing corridor maintenance further in item 23. There's actually, if you look at the expenditure plan for Measure D, some shared responsibility between both the active transportation portion of Measure D and the rail portion of Measure D for corridor maintenance. All right, seeing no one else, uh, go ahead. Uh, who's your mic is over there uh, at the podium. Hi, I'm Sally. I'm Sally Arnold, and I'm um, I'm the representative for Friends of the Rail and Trail today here at the meeting. And I just want to say that um, though obviously we're concerned also about number eight, you know, the trail maintenance continually being deferred due to high um, costs, we do recommend approving this item um, because we understand that Measure D money is limited. And of course, we want to have enough money to build more trail and plan for rail. Um, but as uh, Commissioner Brown mentioned, you know, these repairs aren't going to get any cheaper. And leaving aside this particular bid in this particular location, um, th this is a chronic problem about how are we going to complete rail maintenance for the entire section. And um, it seems like that might require some creative thinking um, to but it's it's an ongoing problem. And and you know, a lot of times I hear restatements of why it's a problem, which I appreciate. But, um, but Friends of the Rail and Trail is really interested in kind of what's the comprehensive plan to overcome those problems for the whole whole uh, corridor. But we do support uh, the staff recommendation in this case for item number eight. Thank you. Ms. Arnold. All right, seeing no other hands raised online or here in chambers, we'll return to the Commission for Action. Well, we, before we do that, um, I wanted to ask staff about item seven. Uh, we. Um, some regularity here that uh, EIR on that project was tiered off the HOV lane project. And my understanding is that it wasn't. So I'd like to get a response from staff on whether any tiering was used for that. E I yes, and you've asked this question at a previous meeting. Okay. My answer remains the same. The projects were not tiered. Uh, that project was not tiered off of the programmatic document. Um, standalone environmental document. I think it's important to get that in the record again, since it keeps coming up. I also um, we received a letter that was essentially read by the testimony about the lack of alternatives analysis and the lack of BMT analysis in the EIR. <laughs> I did uh, review the EIR. Uh, it's a it's a confusing document in a way because it's both a federal document and need. NEPA as well as a CEQA document. Um, and I found sections that did talk about alternatives, I did find a discussion of VMP. 
as well. So I think that uh, both of those concerns, <clears throat> they may be, uh, people with concerns may feel that the discussion was not adequate, but it is definitely there. So I just wanted to make sure that my understanding of what the EIR did. Thank you. Your understanding is the same as mine. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schiffer and Commissioner Rockton. Move approval of the consent agenda. I'll, I'll second it. I, I just had a quick comment on item eight with my second to, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, it is, you know, a different era that we're living in this post pandemic mm -hmm. world. I think that costs are going up. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure projects in our in our area, especially well, after the flood occurrence, the fires. Um, you know, even city of Watsonville is having a hard time getting any any bids on their RFPs that go out for big infrastructure projects. Even our own infrastructure projects go out to bid. They come back, we get them. In the middle of the project, they go up in costs, and we're scrambling. And so I think we have to face that reality at some point that the costs are just going up. You know, and accept these bids at some point. Um, but I just wanted to point that out uh, with my second, the uh, Commissioner Rockins. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. We have a motion from Commissioner Rockins, a second from Commissioner Hernandez. Any further discussion? None. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. We will now proceed with item 19 Commissioner reports. Does any commissioner? Have anything you'd like to share with the whole commission? Mr. Johnson? Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess on behalf of our city council and our citizens, I want to welcome you to uh, Scotts Valley. We usually have a lot better weather than this. I don't know who brought this, but uh, um, we're happy that uh, we're able to host the RTC. Um, for those people that had a little bit of uh, trouble finding parking spots, uh, our apologies. We are the only city in, I think, the county that doesn't have parking meters, so there's that. Uh, with our budget, we should probably rethink that uh, position a little bit. Um, I do, you know, I've been I've been here for a while, and you know, I've heard a lot of the lament of um, sensible transportation folk and everything. And every once in a while, I will ask by a show of hands. Uh, because there are, there are people who have legitimate climate concerns, but do they act upon them? And, you know, we have a bus 35 that is, uh, and I've measured it, 285 yards from here. So anybody wishing to kind of follow their position on climate change is always welcome to take that bus. And I'm just wondering, did anybody do that today, including people who are you ready? So for those people that are continually hammer, hammer, hammer that cards are evil, they're still part of our life. And so, um, and with respect to, you know, only having 8% or 17% or whatever, everybody here who represents their communities knows that the projects that we do have and we do need to do are essential for the lives of our citizens. Sometimes that's asphalt on roads, thoroughfares that have, for example, um, from San Lorenzo Valley, 35,000 people a day use Mount Hermon Road. Okay, So when we fix that road, it's because of all the traffic that we have. And the same on Scotts Valley Drive and Highway 17 and so forth. So we just wanted to kind of, you know, Point that out. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Commissioner Richard Sarah uh, report. All right. I think that'll proceed with the director's report. Uh, thank you, Chair Koenig and fellow commissioners. Um, I just have a couple of announcements to make today. Um, it is Caltrans planning grant season, and I'm happy to announce that RTC applied for and received $1.9 million for three new sustainable tran transportation planning uh, projects uh, study. These three grants will provide planning studies that focus on rural highway safety, as well as transportation and management, coastal resiliency along the North Coast Highway 1 corridor. First, RTC will receive $285,000 to develop the Santa Cruz County Rural Highway Safety Plan to enhance roadway safety for users throughout the county on our six conventional state highways. 
They include Highway 1 north of the City of Santa Cruz limits, uh, Highway 9, Highway 236, Highway 35, and the rural sections of Highways 129 and 152. Through data-driven analysis, the Rural Highway Safety Plan will identify locations and patterns of crashes in order to generate and prioritize measures to eliminate traffic deaths and serious injuries on these highways. This data-driven approach will help identify where resources are needed. Having such a plan in place will help RTC apply for future grants to implement safety-related projects on state highways across the county. Thank you to RTC planner Brianna Goodman on her good work in leading the grant application. Second grant is for $362,000 to develop the Santa Cruz County North Coast Traffic Demand Management Plan which will analyze transportation management strategies for 22 miles of coastal highway from the city of Santa Cruz, northern city limits to the Santa Cruz San Mateo County line. The traffic demand management plan will identify strategies that address visitor transportation needs, safety and operational challenges in the section of Highway 1, high demand for parking and access facilities. Congestion and demand is only expected to increase with the opening of Capati Dairy's National Monument the RTC's North Coast uh, um, Rail Trail project. The plan will also consider alternative modes such as bicycling and recreational rail service on the North Coast. In addition to identifying safety improvements, the project will also identify ways to reduce vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you to RTC planner Grace Blakesley on her good work in leading this grant application. And finally, RTC will receive $1.25 million and Caltrans planning grant funding to develop a plan for coastal resiliency along Highway 1 corridor at two locations, Waddell Creek and San Vicente Creek. Preliminary investigations indicate that the existing Highway 1 bridge over Waddell Creek and the Santa Cruz branch rail line and future Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Rail corridor over San Vicente Creek are vulnerable to coastal climate change impacts. This project will identify short, medium, and long-term actions for viability and resilience to climate stressors on these transportation facilities in tandem with ecological restoration of Waddell Creek and San Vicente Creek ecosystems, including nature-based resilience solutions. The RTC will partner the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County, Caltrans District 5 on these two project locations. Partners are looking forward to this, looking towards the success of of previous work at Spots Creek, also on the North Coast, as a model of how to address these climate challenges and move them forward to project delivery. Thanks again to RTC planner Grace Blakesley on her, um, again, good work leading this grant application. RTC staff is excited to get started on these important planning studies and will provide more information regarding schedule and public participation opportunities over the next few months. Finally, I have an announcement on the county's new wheelchair accessible on-demand rail ride service. You <clears throat> may remember that at our last RTC meeting, the commission authorized RTC staff to enter into a contract with Community Bridges, who operates the lift line, to implement a new program of on-demand ride service for passengers who need wheelchair accessible vehicles. Community Bridges has announced that starting September 18th, uh, county residents requiring wheelchair accessible rides will be able to schedule a ride, an on-demand ride, at a flat rate of $5. The service expansion is made possible due to $115,000 in funding from the California Public Utilities Commission, new transportation network company access for all program. The funding is ge generated through a $0.10 cent a ride fee on regular on-demand service providers such as Uber and Lyft. Thank you, Community Bridges, for your strong participation, uh, partnership, and for the excellent service you provide to our community. My appreciation um, also goes out to RTC planner Amanda Marino for her work in admi administering the TNC Access for All program. That concludes my director's report. Thank you, Executive Director Preston. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? Mr. Schifrin. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I really want to congratulate the staff for getting the planning grants. Um, they're going to be very helpful, and the work that's been done is really appreciated. I have a question about the $1.2 million grant 
is that related to the commission um, commission's segment five project at the Davenport parking lot where as part of the coastal commission approval the commission agreed to follow up trying to work on the long-term problems with the San Francisco coming in. Is that kind of the follow-up to that? It's the first step, of, or actually the second step of many. The first step was to program um, a long-term project in our regional transportation plan, which we did. And we went after mm -hmm. this grant um, so we could start doing uh, initial planning work um, meet our commitments to the Coastal Commission. So essentially we're carrying out our uh, commitment to the Coastal Commission to move forward with a long-term solution to the problem of that in that area. Yes, we are very committed to meeting our commitment. I think that's, you know, it's really great. I want to thank our staff and also thank Caltrans for moving the grants to the Commission. Important and I'm really looking forward to the work that's being done. Given the increased use by the public of the North Coast, I think it's desirable moving in this direction. Thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. Comments or questions from commissioners? Being none, is there any member of the public that wishes to comment on the director's report? None. Uh, we will proceed with the Caltrans report. Morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is John Olenik. I'm from Caltrans District 5, Transportation Planning Manager, in behalf here today of our District Director, Scott Eads. And I just wanted to start with, we are equally thrilled about the results of the Sustainable Transportation Planning Grant process and the results. Mm -hmm. uh, not besides those mentioned already, our district-wide, we received 10 grants uh, amongst our five counties. And, and locally, uh, AMBAG, the MPO, they received a grant. Uh, your neighbors to the South Monterey County received uh, some funding for some study work as well. So we just we get to reflect on the fact that uh, great projects have started with really good planning efforts. So we look forward to working you know, with staff and communities to carry forward those planning efforts. Uh, other announcements, just briefly to mention some uh, activities going on uh, in the in the area, in the in the county, having to do with construction and closures. Uh, as you can imagine, not just because of all the storms, but just our projects in general, there's a lot of activity going on throughout the county. So just, I wanted to highlight a few uh, points. These have been sent out through press releases, but just for the benefit of our group here today, uh, there's gonna be a closure, a rolling closure on Highway 1 uh, north of Santa Cruz for the Ironman um, bike portion of the of the event. So it's a rolling closure starting this, this Sunday, the 10th, and uh, CHP and everyone will be available to help manage that closure. Another item to note for activities and construction is that uh, we have we have a series of construction projects uh, in the San Lorenzo Valley, Highway 9, Highway 236, uh, leading the future, even another one on Highway 35 to help do the long-term um, cleanup and repair work in the storms. But something, uh, a project more uh, starting to happen more sooner is one starting on the 14th, starting next week. It's going to be on Highway 9, Ben Loman, and it is going to be a full closure, but it's going to be night work. So uh, again, this has gone out on press releases, but just for the benefit of sharing here, and please feel free to pass on information that you receive through our social media accounts um, as, as a way to let the public know. And, and detours are available. Emergency vehicles will be able to get through if they need to, but the, this will be night work. We're doing our best to um, scale our work. We, we would like to work longer hours uh, throughout the day, but understanding the needs and the traffic patterns, we're doing our best to shorten our work window to, to start later and end sooner, just so that uh, it's, it's it's the best scenario that we can get to. We're both accomplishing our work and keeping the traveling public safe. Next, uh, I wanted to mention also of a of a project. It's actually happening in District 4 in Santa Clara County, but it will be a significant project. Just want to share it for the benefit of uh, everyone here in the constituents. Is on, it's going to be in the city of Mountain View on Highway 101 on Saturday, this weekend, the 9th. So Saturday night to Sunday morning, gonna, it's going to be a full closure of Highway 101 in Mountain View. So knowing the proximity, there might be those that yourselves might be going or uh, others you know might be going. So wanted to, uh, that went on in a press release, but just wanted to share that for everyone here too. And then lastly, uh, we you know we work with our partners, the CHP, our county partners, our, our regional planning agency partners on, on programs that promote safety. And a recent one that the CHP is rolling out is one called 
it's a it's a program for electric bike safety. It's a training program. So you might look out for that, or you might uh, mention uh, to those you know who are electric bike users, or uh, there's going to be an education campaign associated with that. And so it's it's one of the many new realities that we have amongst our, our district, our counties, and our state, and it's it's good. But uh, you know the electric bikes have their own set of challenges as far as knowing the rules of the road and whatnot. So we're glad that CHB was able to kick off this effort. And in general, as far as noticing and find, finding best access to Caltrans, I always encourage folks to um, test themselves to our social media accounts, our Twitter, Facebook, our Instagram, and our and our quick map postings. It's the best way to keep right on top of what's happening with our activities. Uh, when we know something's going to happen, it's usually just within a few hours that we're able to post it so that everyone knows what's going on as well. I found myself needing that this morning, traveling here today, <laughs> so that I could work my way around if there was any collisions and any congestion and such. So. They are useful and helpful, and I always try to encourage everyone to do that. So thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you for the excellent report. There are comments or questions from commissioners. Commissioner Montesino. Yeah, I, oh, yeah I, don't, I, I don't have any questions on the, on the projects, but there's a, um, a safety concern in our area in the city of Watsonville where there's a sidewalk issue of detachment and a potential um, need of a retaining wall because the sidewalk's tilted built it in sideways and it's just, just a safety concern because we're someone's going to you know fall through the cracks or or go on on the on the side of the road between uh on main street from um clifford and um <clears throat> before you get to main it's a small portion of the sidewalk but it's the only side of the sidewalk and that is it's just a safety concern. it's it's tilted sideways and it looks like a, a it, it looks like a wave so i don't know share responsibility i don't know but uh, thank you. Maybe after the meeting, we can speak briefly and I can get the exact location. I do know we do have several projects that are under development you know, in the area in Watsonville. So it's possible that this the correction is part of that, but we could talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Montesino. Commissioner McPherson. I want to thank um, Caltrans for its attention it's given to Santa Cruz County, in particular Santa Rosa Valley, which was mentioned. Uh, we all have budgets and government agencies and then Fires happen and storms happen, and there are emergencies and serious closures. We've uh, Caltrans has corrected one. Uh, it took a lot of patience from Santa Rosa Valley residents on Highway Nine, and now we're talking about another one by Jay's Crossing uh, in Ben Lomond, right near the uh, uh, Senior Center there in Ben Lomond. Um, Highway Two Thirty Six is another one. Highway Two Thirty Five or Thirty Five. Um, there's a lot going on and a lot that has been committed by Caltrans to get this done as quickly as possible. And as um, Mr. Lennox said, uh, the, it'll be night work on uh, Highway 9 when when it starts. And uh, I, I just want to say thank you for giving immediate attention. I know it takes longer with these slides because you can't cut into them or you're going to get more slides. Uh, they've experienced the same thing in Big Sur in Monterey County. But uh, Really, Caltrans has come to the table to help the people of Santa Cruz County, in particular Santa Rosa Valley, in some serious, serious uh, situations. And I really appreciate it. I know you're doing it uh, night work, so that'll accommodate uh, as many people as possible to do their regular traveling. But uh, it's much appreciated in Santa Cruz County, and particularly in Santa Rosa. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner McPherson. All right, seeing no other uh, commissioner comments or questions, we'll take uh, questions or comments from the public. Uh, former Commissioner Aurelio Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and again, apologies, I haven't been doing the Zoom meetings in uh, two years, so I apologize if I spoke earlier uh, out of the agenda items. Uh, but anyways, I do have a question for Caltrans. And it is referring to what uh, our mayor, Eduardo Montesino, was saying on the section of the Green Valley, uh, between Green Valley and Clifford on Highway 152, uh, right in the area of the slough. It, it's apparent that that section of highway is slipping uh, because you can see the road is, is buckling in different areas and it's sinking. And so my question to Caltrans is that, are they going to be waiting for emergency repairs on that section of uh highway um, before it completely collapses or uh, are, or do are we going to have to wait as a community for that section of highway to collapse for the uh, state of California to 
uh, move forward on uh, repairing that. I'd like to answer the question, go ahead. Sure, thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, thank, thank you for the note. Well, I'll, I'll note the location again, maybe with the uh, commissioner here today, we can talk about that a little more. Um, we we in no way want our you know facilities to collapse. And so we, we are very proactive to the extent that we can to monitor and manage uh, slide activity, stormwater flows, uh, to keep the facility open. That ultimately it's our goal to keep the road safe and open for everyone. So if there's issues, then uh, we're, I'm glad to to highlight flag those to those who are responsible in our maintenance divisions to do that. Thank you very much. Sounds like there'll be some further discussion about this uh, offline after the meeting and going forward. So uh, great. For, thank you for raising the point and addressing it. All right. Seeing no other comments or questions from uh, the public, thank you again for the Caltrans report. We'll proceed with item 22, which is a presentation on Scotts Valley transportation projects from Interim Public Works Director Steve Yesberg. Good morning, Chair Koenig and Commissioners. Happy to be back in front of the Commission, this time in Scotts Valley, not in Capitola. Um, so I've been here four weeks, and so the presentation tonight is going to be a lot of lists. I apologize for that. Generally, I tried to give more graphics, um, but my unfamiliarity with the projects kind of led me to this uh, position. So anyway, um, next slide, please. One moment uh, for everyone. All right, there we go. Slides are advancing. Okay, so the first is a list of our Measure D projects. I'm having trouble reading that. Unfortunately, I didn't bring a copy. Um, first project is our Bean Creek Road Phase 1 project, which I am happy to announce is 99% complete. We just have a few punch list items to take care of. Um, I have some pictures of that, which will be forthcoming in, in this uh presentation that um, these first slides are all measure D projects that also had some RSTPX money and gas tax money in it. Next would be a Scott Sally Drive uh, slurry seal. Um, we hope to get that accomplished uh, this fall. Um, we're currently uh, just advertising and awarded a contract that includes some of that work. So we're moving forward with that. And again, that's measure D and SB1 money. Following that, oh, much better. Back back one slide. Again, there we go. It's just overall street maintenance. Um, we're going to do some pothole filling and road failure repairs throughout the city. Um, that contract was recently awarded, um, and we anticipate moving forward with that as quickly as we can and try and get it done this fall going into winter. Again, that has measure D, SB1, and gas tax money in it. Next one is the Glenwood Drive Slurry Seal. That is a future project. Um, it has 23, fiscal year 23, 24 funding in it. Um, we are just initiating design and putting plans and bits and bid package together on that. So that will be uh, going out on the streets next spring. Following that, we will do a Mount Hermon Road um, improvement project. This is a combination uh, access transportation, active transportation project and um, traffic management project where we're looking to uh, signalize uh, the traffic signals there as a measure D funded project at this time. Uh, coming back with another phase of the Bean Creek project, which will take it from its current limits to the city limit uh, north of the city here. That is funded in 27, 28, and 28, 29, or 26, 27, 27, 28. With Measure D funds, we will need additional funding for that project that we'll be looking forward um, as we get closer to those dates. Um, then we have two small paving projects um, at the tail end of the five-year plan for Measure D, one on Lockwood Lane and one on Janus Way that we'll be moving forward as, uh, as those come up with funding. Next slide, please. So these are other transportation projects that don't necessarily have um, Measure D in them. And the Mount Hermon, 
Mount Hermon corridor improvements. Um, we're moving forward with that. I kind of covered in with the Measure D projects. We're also going to be using traffic impact fees uh, for a lot of that, uh, the active transportation portion of that. We have the Granite Creek overpass project, which is RSTPX funded and SB1 funded project. This is um, right now scoped to be a pavement repair project. Um, we'll grind and replace the pavement um, from Scott Sally Drive to the intersection with Santa's Village Road. Um, we are looking to try and make some imp improvements, um, pedestrian improvements with that, and also some visual improvements of that overpass that we'll be looking at as we uh, move forward with that project. Last, well, last two are storm damage repair projects, one on Green Hills Road, the other on Bean Creek. These are results of storms last year. We are moving forward um, after some delays and trying to figure out how to fund these projects that we were eligible for FHWA emergency funds. So we are now moving forward um, as quickly as we can to do some emergency repair work uh, before this winter. Most likely we'll go into winter, but we will have contractors on site as we move forward with this to protect the road and keep those road, two roads open. They're both critical roads um, providing access um, to properties that uh, if we can't keep them open, it, long route, long detours for the property owners. Next slide, please. So I just had some photos of uh, the Bean Creek project phase one, uh, one that's, like I said, 99% complete, some before and after. So you can see this one, it's a little hard to see on the before picture, which is the photo on the left. There's a big gap in the sidewalk um, that tied to the Montvale uh, resident area. So we filled in that gap. I think it was a critical gap. A lot of people walked from that neighborhood into uh, Capitol area to Kings Village and area. So filling that sidewalk gap was a huge part of this project. Next slide, please. About midway in the project, there's a rather sharp turn there where we had just uh, warning signs before. We've now installed a full guardrail I think I was told that three or four cars have gone over the edge there over the last two or three years. So this is a huge safety, safety improvement on that road. Next slide, please. And it's also a popular bike route um, for recreational purposes. And so um, we did install plenty of sharrows and they now have a new pavement and striping uh, to ride on on that project. And that's what we hope to continue uh, with phase two. Uh, in a few years. I believe that's the last slide. So at this point, I'd like to thank you for your time and answer any questions I may. Mr. Jesberg, comments or questions from commissioners? Sure. Um, commissioner, uh, yeah. Uh, just want to say uh, congratulations on doing some really critical safety in particular. Uh, but I think in relation to the comment that was made before, I saw that many of your projects are Measure D funded or support. Some are two or three years away from being started. So there's uh, uh, Measure D, uh, you know, really filled the, everybody got something, all modes of transportation, but nobody got what they, enough of what they really want to do. So that's part of the story that we have. It's reality. And uh, I just think that uh, planning ahead for what you want to do, like other agencies have done, uh, is very commendable. And uh, thank you for the job that you've done. Received. Thank you. Pearson, Commissioner Rockin. I just wanted to thank you for the work on Bean Creek Road. It's not just serving the residents of Scotts Valley. I, I ride my bicycle up here. It's one of the most beautiful, beautiful bicycle roads in the county. Thanks for that work. It makes a big difference. It is. I was amazed how much traffic when we were inspecting the project there is on that road. So I'm happy to get it done. Commissioner Rodkin, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. And we're just thankful to have Steve. He came uh, at a very critical time for our city. Um, and uh, he's doing a great job so far. And thanks for showing up today. And also thanks to, to the RTC and um, the uh, funding measures that have helped our city uh, in such a critical way. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. I'll just echo the thanks on the Bean Creek road work i also bike on that road all the time and it's uh it's beautiful and now it's safer too yes so. 
Um, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Well, I could, a moment, I think we'll take public comment. Do any member of the public wish to comment on the uh, Scotts Valley report? I think no one here in chambers. I will go online. Mr. Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Chair Koenig. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jesberg, for the presentation. Uh, just a quick question. Um, over As they do over the Hill a lot of times when they're doing these paving projects, which kind of basically look like the majority of the money was, was going for just putting asphalt down, which I realize is required uh, uh, because our roads have been pretty much ignored for several years. Do you have a consideration or maybe a priority, I would hope, uh, to before you start laying pavement down to look at the possibility of putting in protected bike lanes or bike lanes with green paint uh, or actually widening the road a little bit to uh, get safer bike routes around Scotts Valley? And that's pretty much my question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Do we have any other members of the public that wish to speak? All right, seeing none. Um, I would ask you the question. Director, sure, for, an answer. Yeah, yes. you have any kind of quick build protected. Yeah, so when we we do do our design work on uh, pavement projects, we do look to do complete streets as best we can on those bridges. Like um, as we're doing the Glenwood or Granite Creek overpass, we are adding widening the bike lanes, widening the sidewalks and adding green uh, bike lanes where, where it's uh, called for. So we do do that um, on a slurry seal, probably not so much, but when we do an overlay project, we would be looking at trying to make uh, complete street improvements. Great. Thanks again for the report. Thank you. Pleasure to be here in your beautiful city. All right, we now have uh, a special scheduled item. I don't think it's reflected on the agenda. Um, but we did learn at the last meeting of uh, our current executive directors ending retirement at the end of this year. And so the commission has begun a search uh, well, for a new executive director. And the first step in that uh, is that we determined we'd like to hire a consultant to assist us with recruitment. And uh, we now have scheduled uh, interviews with the two uh, top submissions that were um, given to the commission in response to the RFP that we put out uh, to hire a firm. And uh, we wanted to, uh, we also formed a subcommittee at uh, the last special meeting of this commission uh, to review applications. And uh, the two firms that we are, that the subcommittee recommended move forward are Ralph Anderson and Associates and uh, CPS HR. Excuse me, did we do 23? No, but we do have, uh, so uh, if you'll let me finish. Um, we determined that uh, the, the subcommittee responsible for you know, first suggesting um, which um, which applications to move forward with for a recruitment firm determined that it would be best to uh, have interviews with the two uh, top applicants in public because we recognize that, of course, uh, this decision will impact the entire organization be as transparent as possible and as open as possible. Uh, and provide opportunity for everyone to hear the response of uh, the two uh, ap applicants um, and um, ultimately be able to make comments and ask questions as well. Um, so I believe we have, uh, for starters, uh, Fred Wilson from Ralph Anderson and Associates online. Is that correct? Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Chair Koenig. Um, Mr. Uh, Ralph Anderson and Associates is being represented during the interview process this morning by their CEO. Heather, Heather Rentschler. And then the second, um, and the commission has Ms. Rentschler available for the interview for a 30 minute time period. And then uh, Pam Derby of CPS HR Consulting is available for the second interview. This is part of the consideration that the commission has as item 24 on your agenda, which is the selection of the recruiter. And with that, Ms. Rentschler, Ms. Rentschler is available. Um, the chair has copies of the questions. The committee thought it was appropriate that uh, both applicants receive the same questions so that the commission hears the hears, uh, responses to those inquiries. The committee uh, members and I worked on the 
questions that uh, Chair Koenig has available and is being distributed. I, I have a point of order. Doesn't the commission have to agree to take this item out of order? We had item number 23 on the agenda. We haven't heard it. Um, and this is number item 24. I'm willing to do it, but I think it should be a decision of the commission that we should at least hear rather than just ignoring that we actually have item 23 on the agenda. Are we going to get to item 23? Is that the intention? What, what the, is the, the, the intention is we, uh, the committee thought that it would be appropriate for the commission to be able to interview the two candidates. We had to coordinate with the candidates to be able to schedule their availability. And in conversations with uh, Chair Koenig, we um, did schedule them and the expectation was always that we would come back to item. So the commission would do the interviews um, then come back to item 23, then go into closed session, then make a selection. I'm fine with that. I just think it should have been announced. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. All right, well, then if there's no uh, further questions, we'll proceed with the first interview. Uh, uh, Ms. Rentschler, do you want to provide any sort of opening statement or introduction? Yes, th th thank you very much. And I'm sorry that Fred Wilson is not available today. He happens to be taking a little R&R &R at the moment. So he is uh, unavailable via Zoom. So he asked if I would step in on his behalf. Um, Fred Wilson has been a member of our team for a number of years now. He's a former city manager. And more recently, he's been also doing specific work um, with various transit districts in California. And um, so we've presented our track record in the proposal that was submitted. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, again, I'm president and CEO of Ralph Anderson Associates. Uh, just so that you know, Fred and I often work on projects together. So if he is taking the lead on that, he would be meeting with the uh, search committee and eventually the entire board. Uh, he would be taking the lead on the uh, screening and evaluation of candidates. Uh, but with my involvement, um, I'm also helping to assist in identifying candidates uh, and using my network. Uh, I've been with the firm since 1985, so it's it's a very uh, detailed network that I have both in state and nationally. So I'm certainly open to any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a, a list of questions here uh, for you. I'll ask questions through two. Vice Chair uh, Brown will ask questions three, three and four. And uh, uh, Sandy Brown, who helped prepare the question, will ask questions five and six. Um, so number one, would you please describe your past experience conducting recruitments for senior management positions in transportation agencies in California? Yes, I do believe we submitted um, a listing of uh, agencies uh, to you in the proposal. Um, and we we have certainly worked with some key agencies along the way. Um, for example, Metropolitan Transportation Commission in Northern California. Um, we also work with um, Southern California Association of Government. Um, within their the regional trans transportation uh, ages agency, we've also worked with um, the uh, Riverside County Transportation Commission. Um, we've worked with um, the San Francisco uh, MTA and Ventura County Transportation Commission. Those uh, have involved bringing in. Uh, either the executive or a high level member of the management team. Some of those clients are ongoing clients for us for other support positions, but we believe we have a good network. Uh, we've done some out of state uh, transportation, transit uh, agencies as well. 
And depending on your reach, uh, we would certainly be able to uh, tap into that. But our focus primarily would be within California. Thank you. Second question is what competencies and or qualities should a strong candidate for the RTC's executive director position possess and why? Well, I think we look at the basic pillars uh, of executive leadership. So we look at individuals that bring um, that strategic viewpoint of the service delivery to your constituents and being able to do that in a very cost effective uh, method. So understanding uh, the delivery of services and those that are using it um, and making sure that we can also uh, take into account those underserved areas. So we look at someone's leadership ability, their management of staff and resources. We certainly also look at their understanding of the fiscal related aspects. Uh, there's oftentimes uh, other outside uh, funding uh, that we want to make sure that there's an understanding of the rules and regulations for that. So we're looking at what would be uh, a career experience that is transferable and those attributes and those qualities in those executives that make for uh, someone having a servant leadership approach to the entity, uh, good communication skills, and to work well with the um, board to make sure they carry out uh, the policies that are established. Um. The question I have for you is about developing a candidate profile. Uh, would you develop a candidate profile for this recruitment? And if so, how would you develop the profile? And do you have any suggestions on what should be included in the profile? Uh, yes, thank you for that. Uh, we, we do spend a lot of time at the beginning of the recruitment cycle to make sure that we solicit information from each board member. Um, and we can do that uh, with approval of council, typically, um, in that we would solicit that information uh, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, uh, or if need be, to call together the search committee or the full board to solicit that information. If possible, because it is one-sided that we are taking that information um, from each board member, that helps us to get a sense uh, independently of what the issues are. Uh, we look basically at three areas. Uh, what do you as a board member want to see in that candidate's experience? What do you want to see in that individual's personal attributes? Um, much like the second question, what are those leadership qualities? What are those attributes that they bring? The third area that we ask you to contribute on would be what are the challenges that this person is going to face in this uh, particular position? So we take that information and we synthesize it. We collectively uh, massage it and put it into a brochure uh, that that text comes back to you for final approval before we open up to um, basically go to begin the search process. That timing of the brochure development, we typically will do that within, I'm going to say, seven to 10 working days of when we've completed the interviews with the board. I know based on timing, um, we would want to be able to at least get started on that perhaps mid-month so that we could um, be able to get that stood up and put into the marketplace. We usually keep that brochure open for 30 to 45 days. And so we will uh, add our expertise um, to that text that we've developed 
but this is basically your product that we are helping to assimilate so that it's a marketing piece. It's a piece of collateral to put out to the uh, interested candidates. Great, thank you. And then in terms of interested candidates, what would your advertising plan or your recruitment plan include to ensure that plenty of well-qualified candidates are applying for the position? Again, another good question. Um, certainly we will do all the typical advertising that is done in that particular market. And so we, we did include in our uh, material um, some suggested locations for the um, ad placement. But I can tell you our best candidates come from having a personal phone call from either myself or Fred Wilson to let them know about the opportunity, to let them know that we have met with the board. Uh, here's the situation with an upcoming retirement. Uh, may we send you our brochure to a personal email address? Um, so that targeted outreach is much of what we will rely rely upon as well. And having had some recent experience with some other agencies in California, we have individuals we can call that not only might be a candidate, but they might also nominate individuals for consideration. So we use kind of a double track, and that is doing the standard advertisement for those people that are looking for jobs. But then we also take the second track, and that is to uh, very proactively reach out to individuals that perhaps don't even know the position is available, and we introduce it to them in that capacity. All right, I have uh, two more questions. Okay. And I'll start uh, with uh, number five. Uh, this is on uh, screening. And um, wanna ask you what screening criteria you would recommend be used to determine uh, the best, the most qualified candidates for this position? Okay. Um, well, I'm going to refer to the recruitment brochure that becomes our guiding principles, so to speak. It's a schematic of what you want in terms of attributes, in terms of career experience, education. Um, we, we would also be comparing budgets and uh, types of um, services that are provided. So we use that brochure to help us through the screening that we do. The screening first starts on paper based on what their submitted information would be. So they will have an evaluation done. Uh, typically, Fred would do that, and then I would be involved uh, in kind of a uh, devil's advocate, so to speak, in double checking and contributing what I might know about some of those candidates, but he, he certainly has access to uh, the databases that we've maintained over the years as well. So that screening criteria on paper, and then candidates are determined to be qualified uh, or an alternate, maybe a second tier, or those that we would not progress further with. If we're working with a search committee, they're made aware of where we are with that um, candidate pool. We will also do preliminary video interviews with those candidates and solicit additional information. As our client, we come back and review that with you. And again, we're we're staying to the guidelines that we've all agreed to through the recruitment brochure. And so that criteria is going to guide us and stay with us each step of the way as we move through this process. Thank you. Okay, last question. Um, 
in the this is about uh staff involvement in the past rtc staff have been involved in the recruitment and interview process for the executive director position and rtc staff representatives have advised us that the commission of their interest to be involved again uh can you describe some of the processes that you have incorporated in prior recruitments uh, to involve stakeholders, including staff in this process? Well, certainly we look to the commission for um, direction typically about what you feel you want to do, but we certainly have included a variety of stakeholders in different capacities for different positions. But I'd like to speak to the staff involvement. Um, and I think we, we feel very strongly about a collaborative approach to doing this. Uh, make no mistake, it's the commission's decision who they would bring in, but we both have the same end game. We want this person to be successful and it's not just a one-sided decision. This candidate has to make sure that they also want to join the organization. So there is a curiosity and uh, an important level of review that they want to do based on their own needs. So I would say that we would work through the search committee through the initial stages of screening. Uh, then we would do interviews with the full body. Um, once we bring that down to a uh, core number, perhaps we have two or three top candidates then, I would be certainly very interested in having a staff have a meet and greet with the candidate with some pre-defined uh, um, parameters. They might submit questions in advance to Fred so Fred can screen those, um, but to allow an interchange, not just for staff to ask the candidate question, questions, but for the candidate also to dialogue with staff. We want to make sure that there's a good match all the way around. And so um, if we were to involve other stakeholders, um, that may be something that you would want to do up front with some of your local partners so we can blend that into the brochure. But from our perspective, the commission makes that final determination, but they certainly can solicit input from different sources and also from staff. This market that we're in, the uh, typical closed interviews are done in an executive session without releasing the candidate names, but staff would be, um, introduced to the candidates under the knowledge that this was a confidential process so that we did not have the risk of losing a candidate. It's a very tight competitive market now, and we want to make sure that we do everything we can to keep candidates in your process and also not to have any seepage or uh, leaks prematurely that would uh, diminish the candidate pool. But we want a collaborative, successful uh, placement. And uh, we certainly would work with you to develop something that works for your team. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sandy Brown. Uh, uh, those are the end of our Regular questions. We want to make sure we ask both uh, both applicants. But now, if any commissioner has other questions or comments they'd like to make, when? Yeah. Good morning. Great. Chief. Afterwards, um, 
How do you? I'm afraid I was not able to hear you. I work. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. So in, in screening your web page, Chief of uh -huh. Police, can you hear me now? Yes. Chief of Police seems to be one of your most frequent positions for which you've recruited. I have to assume that consensus building is a requirement there. Yeah. This job, there's a lot of hot topic issues in a very divided constituency. How do you screen for the ability to build consensus in your applicant? Well, the most important ability to do that is track record of what they've done in their most recent or current position. So we are not just looking at their paperwork that was submitted. We're going to look at uh, the activity in the area, any of the controversy, anything that hits the paper uh, and we'll be discussing that with the candidates as well. So we ask for uh, examples, and those examples are things that we, again, try and uh, confirm that they, in fact, were leading that discussion or involved in that discussion. And we try very hard to make sure we uh, make sure that the individual that is uh, speaking to us is actually the one that has been facilitating those discussions and a uh, active participant with those stakeholders. And so we we do that often, uh, whether it be a campus environment. And in fact, we just worked with UC Santa Cruz on their police chief search. Um, and so we're familiar with the area and the and the housing market and things like that. But we we like to get the input uh, early on uh, from candidates in terms of where there have been similar situations and controversies so that we can see if there is a good match. And then we validate that with what we're seeing through the process and also uh, through the internet and article searches. And then later on, confirming that with references. For the question, Commissioner Quinn. Questions, Commissioners? All right, seeing none. Um, thank you, Ms. Rentschler. Did you want to, if you'd like to make any kind of uh, closing comments or statements, you're welcome to. Not required. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to step in for Fred Wilson. Uh, I know he would have liked to have been here, uh, but this was certainly pre-scheduled and we thought video would be possible, but we realized that uh, it was too risky to take that chance. So again, I thank you for your time today and best wishes as you move forward. And I'm available over the next few days, should you have any other follow-up questions uh, Fred will be gone for another week or so. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll sign off now. We have our next applicant from CPS HR available. Yeah. Um, we are we're emailing her right now to see if she can schedule. Okay. Well, uh, in that case. We could take a five minute break and come back at uh, 1031. Thank you uh, appreciate you joining us on relatively short notice uh, and helping us to keep this process right. move, moving along. Um, I wanna start by giving you an opportunity to make any opening statement um, about your application experience. Certainly. Well, my name is Pam Derby. I manage the executive recruitment uh, function at CPSHR Consulting. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with us, we're actually a joint powers authority here in California. We're a full service human resources consulting company, but only for the public sector. We can also do nonprofit work uh, for our charter, but most of our work is all 
uh, local government and at the state level. Um, we've been in business as a sole entity, as a standalone entity for about 37 years now. Um, we were originally part of the state personnel board starting in the 30s. So um, our mission has been an ongoing one for now almost 100 years. I man as I mentioned, I manage the executive recruitment function. I've been at CPS now. I'm in my 20th year. Uh, I joined CPS from Yuba County, where I was the aide to the Board of Supervisors. And so my entire career has been in local government and uh, nonprofit lobbying associations, so closely tied to state and federal lobbying previous to my county work. Um, I have done many of these executive director and GM recruitments, and I did conduct Mr. Peterson's recruitment previously, so I'm well acquainted with the agency. Great, thank you. Yeah, and um, you mentioned that you helped for, uh, direct recruitment for our current executive director, Preston. Uh, I'm wondering if Preston, you could pardon me. Yeah, uh, if you could speak to a little bit more of your past experience conducting recruitments for senior management positions uh, at particular transportation agencies within California? Uh, so it, it with both MPOs and transportation agencies, uh, it's rather lengthy. Uh, I do all of MTC's chief executive recruitments. I've done the last two executive directors, general counsel, uh, chief financial officer. I'm just finishing the executive director recruitment for, uh, Solana, for Sonoma County Transportation. Um, authority. I have, we work very closely with AC Transit. We're doing all of their executive recruitments at this time. Um, I have done the, the executive director recruitment for Sandag. Um, I'm now doing their, I'm just finishing their independent performance appraiser, auditor. Um, we've worked with Sam Trans. I've done many recruitments for the DOT in San Jose. Uh, we have also, I've also worked very closely with SFMTA over the years. Um, so have done, you know, literally, you know, probably between 30 and 50 recruitments of one type or another for either MPOs, transit authorities, transportation authorities, or commissions. Great, thank you. And what competencies or qualities should a strong candidate for this type of position possess in your view? Well, you know, some of that depends on what the board is looking for, for the direction that the commission is headed. Um, obviously, Mr. Preston was an engineer, planner. Oftentimes, they're planners. Um, but you're looking for someone who is collaborative, is good at working with the board, uh, good at working with stakeholders. There are many stakeholders. Hopefully they understand the funding streams for transportation, have had experience melding funding streams and are innovative in that way, um, that they do understand <clears throat> project management, um, large projects, um, that they're good with staff, uh, that you know, in the last recruitment, I, Mr. Dondera was known for, you know, was beloved by the staff, and that was something that the board was looking for. Um, so it's a mix of things, typically, but a lot of that also comes out of where, as I said, the board is looking for the commission to move into the future. Um, we need to have those conversations with each one of you to determine what the competencies are that you're looking for. Great, thank you. Yeah, Vice Chair Brown will ask the next couple of questions. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, would you develop a candidate profile for this recruitment? And if so, how would you develop the profile? And do you have any suggestions on what should be included in the profile? So yes, we absolutely do that. As I mentioned, the first step is we would like to speak with each board member individually, each commission member individually have a conversation with each of you to determine the things that you're looking for. Um, oftentimes, organizations will want us to do some stakeholder engagement, so speaking to some of your major stakeholders, uh, speaking with staff. Um, as I recall, I spoke to the entire staff in groups. I spent a day 
in Santa Cruz the last time, speaking with groups of staff members to determine what they were looking for, you know, the things that were important to them. Um, we also have done online surveys. Uh, we'll oftentimes do that if you have, you know, certain community groups that you'd like us to reach out to. Um, but I think that, you know, the profile you want to include, the question that we get from candidates is, what are they really looking for? And we want to make sure that we have portrayed that in the Canada profile that we're putting in the marketing materials. Um, that's why we have those conversations. We don't want your marketing materials to just say the rote language that they oftentimes do. And oftentimes many of the things that you're looking for are the same as another organization. But there are always some of those pearls that are things that we want to include to make sure that the people that are reading it understand that this commission wants this executive director to have these characteristics. And so we think that the profile needs to include not only, you know, what are those minimum requirements, what's the education, what is the, you know, experience level, what are the certifications, et cetera, but it needs to include all of those characteristics, special characteristics that are unique, that are going to make the next executive director successful for Santa Cruz County, RTC. Great, thank you. Uh, and then also, what would your advertising plan or recruitment plan include to ensure that plenty of well-qualified candidates apply for the position? So every recruitment we do, well, we do have a significant ongoing database of candidates that has well over 100,000 uh, individuals. We do... Uh, do research, new research on every position that we do. So some of that comes out of the conversations that we have with the board. Is it important that they have California experience? Is it important that they've worked on projects over $500,000? Do they need to be an engineer? Um, coming up with, the most important thing is coming up with the outreach plan and our initial outreach blast would go out to our entire list of the types of individuals that you're looking for across the country. But then the most important thing is that our aggressive follow-up outreach with individuals that, you know, we know from the profile we've determined from our conversations with you are the type of people you're looking for. So then um, that then includes social media, LinkedIn, um, my I have a terrific staff that um, does all types of social media. They're doing videos. Um, we get quite a bit of LinkedIn um, traffic. However, um, we do do analytics, and we know that 65%, average 65% of our applicants come from our direct outreach to people. And so coming up with that plan and who are the individuals that we're going to make sure we follow up with, that we're talking to, to try to encourage to apply. Obviously, we are going to place uh, advertising as well. But analytics show that that really just gets it in front of people. When people click through to apply, it's usually typically less than 1% of the individuals that apply that click through those links. Um, 7% come from LinkedIn and 65% are from that direct outreach. But that is always determined by our conversations with you. Thank you so much. I have two more questions and then we'll, we're gonna open it up. Uh, my uh, next question is what screening criteria uh, what do you recommend be used to determine uh, which are the best qualified candidates for the position? So all the applicants apply directly to CPS. We will screen any candidate that meets what you've determined are the minimum qualifications. So we're going to do a comprehensive screening interview with those candidates. The questions asked of those candidates are 
you know, there are going to be those typical housekeeping questions. We want to make sure we know what type of budgets they've managed, you know, what size of staff, you know, we're going to talk to them about their leadership and management style. We're going to talk to them about, you know, their collaboration skills. Have they worked with electeds? Have they worked with boards? What types of presentations have they made? You know, do they understand funding streams, et cetera? Um, but then there's always two or three questions that are behavioral and that uh, are around those things that the board indicated are the types of unique qualities that they're looking for in these individuals. So we want to have some of those fit questions in that process as well. Um, and so then we're looking at when we're doing those interviews, we're deciding, do these individuals meet the qualifications that you're looking for? You know, how do they do in that interview process? Um, have they done their homework? What do they actually know about SEC, RTC? Do they really want this job? I mean, it's important for us to determine all of those things so that when we come to you with our client report, we can honestly say, you know, these five or six people interviewed very well. We have done media checks on all of them. Um, there is nothing negative that's come up or this there is something negative and we've talked to them about it. Um, but the reality is, is that when we get to that point, the if you're going to use the executive committee, whether it's going to be the full board commission or the executive committee um, for this fir first part of the process, um, we're going to share with you the resumes of all of the candidates that met the minimum qualifications. We will recommend after our screening process who we think uh, should move forward, but that really is up to you. And sometimes there are candidates in group two that possibly we've screened out for one reason or another, um, but you're aware of them. There is a political reason that we need to do, that you need to interview them. Um, you know, that's up to, there's nothing set in stone. We also are oftentimes we're asked, well, so do you have a, a number? And um, we do not. It's about how the candidates uh, perform in the screening interviews. We're not going to cut it at five, seven, eight, whatever the case may be. Um, and so that screening criteria is really, again, you know, it needs to be about what you're looking for. So those are the types of things we do in the process, though. And then we also help with coming up with all of the questions that then probably the executive committee and then the full board will use for your processes. Um, we help you decide what those processes are going to look like. And then we facilitate those processes um, for you and the candidates. Thank you. Okay, this is our last prepared question. I want to ask about staff engagement uh, in the process. Uh, so in the, as you know, in the past, staff have been involved in the recruitment and interview process for the executive director position. And RTC staff representatives have indicated to us that they are interested in being involved again, uh, uh, meaningfully. Uh, so uh, if you could describe some of the processes that you have incorporated in prior recruitments to involve uh, stakeholders, you mentioned stakeholders, but um, in particular staff in the recruitment process. Certainly. Well, in your last recruitment, we actually had a staff panel that interviewed the candidates and gave feedback to, I believe it was the executive committee um, oftentimes that is the process that's used. I definitely, I think it's most important that we speak to them in, in the beginning to get their feedback about, you know, how they're feeling about things, what they're looking for, what's important to them so that we can share that with you. Um, we do recommend that whether you choose for the staff to actually have a panel or we do a meet and greet type of situation so that it's a little more informal that the candidates come in and and can mingle with the candidates for say 45 minutes to an hour so that people can more casually ask questions that 
they don't rank candidates, that they provide you with feedback. And inevitably, they are going to tell you this is our favorite candidate, but you don't want to be in a position, we don't feel that you want to be in a position where the staff is able to tell you we didn't like that person at all, and that's really who the board wants to pick. Um, because this is your choice, well, we feel that the staff should have some input and you should understand the things that are important to them and that they should have some contact with the candidates. Um, we don't want to put you in a situation where it appears that you're going against a staff recommendation. And so there are several ways to do it. As I said, we've done the meet and greet type of situation. We have done actual staff panels. Um, I don't suggest that staff is part of the board's interviews. Um, I just, I feel and uh, that it can lead to some of those, again, some of those situations where the staff can maybe be pitted against the commission, which is not, um, you know, the outcome that you're looking for. Great. Thank you. Are there other questions from commissioners? Mr. Quinn? Well, good morning and thanks for your time. I noticed on your webpage that you posted for a leadership position with Sonoma County Transportation. And one of the qualifications there is their quote, a relationship bill. And you also have a posting in Utah where you say, quote, you're looking for neutrality and objectivity. How do you screen the candidate to make sure they have a proven record to be able to achieve those objectives? So for, I believe for the neutrality probably was talking about the public policy analysts that we're doing for UTA. Um, and my questions, my screening questions to the candidates you know, I asked them about the types of policy positions that they'd worked on and, you know, asked them about had there been a, a situation where um, they felt that the their electeds, um, whoever it may be that they were producing policy for, where they had felt that, you know, it should, you know, that and people were opposed to it, and what did they do in that situation? Um, those are those behavioral type of questions that I mentioned that, you know, that's what's important is to find out how they've actually behaved in those situations. And so if you put them in that scenario, they can give you an example. Um, for Sonoma County, I think a, a good example is one of the candidates that I spoke with I said, you haven't worked, you know, this would be your first, this individual it would have been their first opportunity to report directly to a board. And I said, so what do you do if, if staff has a feeling about a position, but you know that the board commission is, is opposed or they're not on the same page, what do you do? And their response was, well, I guess then we just have to have a really long workshop session. So, you know, the meaning behind that being we're going to get we're going to get them to our point. And it was never mentioned that, but at the end of the day, it's up to the commission. They make the policy. And so obviously that individual was not ready for this role and hadn't had enough exposure to working with boards and the understanding of how policy works to be able to determine we may have a position as staff but it's our job to implement the policy that is meted out by the board or commission. And so those are the ways that we talk about those things. You know, relationship building obviously is talking to them about the types of stakeholders they currently work with, what are some of the types of, of projects or, or types of initiatives that they've been working with individuals. How, you know, what does their network look like? Um, obviously, some of that are some uh, some of those questions also are things that we are going to then vet when we're doing their reference checks if they're one of those two or three finalist candidates. I'll just follow up quickly. Obviously, there's some hot topic issues here in Santa Cruz. How would you gauge or prep a candidate to be able to address those? 
Well, I think that it's important that we do talk about issues and priorities in the marketing materials so that up front, um, candidates are aware that these are the issues and priorities that are important to the commission. Um, and then I also believe that they need, we want to make sure that they're reading the media, that they're looking at, you know, I always tell candidates, if they, in their screening interview, I real, they have done some homework, so I know that they're really interested. They're looking at those types of things. I mean, I love it when somebody says in that first interview, I went back and I read commission minutes, et cetera. But those are the types of things that we met, let them know they need to be doing. They need to make sure that they are reading the media. They need to make sure that they're looking at board reports. It may be that there are certain things we may have in your last um, recruitment. Both of the finalist candidates did a presentation that there was a scenario that we gave them that was based on a current issue. And then they did a 15 minute presentation to the full commission. Um, so those are the types of things that they need to be doing to prepare themselves. But I do think it's important, you know, obviously there are some things that are closed session items. You know, there may be things brewing that really cannot be conveyed. And so, um, and those are things that once they are become, are appointed that then the commission is able to share with them. But, you know, certainly we want them to know what the commission believes are the current issues and priorities and the things that they're gonna be dealing with. And, you know, we try to be as transparent and honest with them as possible. Um, but it's also our job to make sure that they can see as this position in the best light possible. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. Commissioner Brown. I just had one additional question. Um, you had mentioned, of course, and, and we're aware of uh, your recruitment of our uh, current executive director. But I'm wondering if you could speak to your experience in recruiting for positions in Santa Cruz County generally and your familiarity with the housing market specifically in this region and how you would share information about that with any interested candidates. So we haven't, we do, we've done considerable work in Monterey County, Santa Clara County. Um, we do extensive work for the city of San Jose, Santa Clara Valley Water District. Um, and so our work in Santa Cruz has has been a little more limited, but the reality is we're facing the same housing situation. You know, we do a ton of work in San Francisco and the housing situation is is similar in, you know, the greater Bay Area, obviously, is it's it's not plentiful, it's expensive. Um that's one of the things that comes into play typically with our follow-up outreach is that we really are try to look at people geographically. You know, if somebody applies from Kansas who is, you know, qualified, we're going to speak with them, but the first question is going to be, okay, have you actually truly looked at the cost of housing and the availability of housing in Santa Cruz County. Um, because most people in, you know, in the Midwest are not gonna be able to make the jump. You know, what we wanna hear from those people is, well, I'm actually from California originally. My in-laws live in Santa Clara County or Santa Cruz County or Monterey County. Um, and so we're very aware and, you know, we have, we have means to come back. Um, so it's something that we deal with in, frankly, in many, many of our, our recruitments. And we just need to vet candidates and to make sure that, you know, we don't want to get down to the end when somebody has said, oh, I, I can do it. Um, and then they they back out on us because they've then they've really looked at it. I mean, it's really up to us to vet the situation and, and make sure that they truly understand whether it's that we need to send them 
Zillow link, et cetera. Um, yeah, we have done that, frankly. Um, we have helped candidates uh, for a recent recruitment for the city of San Francisco. We set the candidate up with a realtor. Um, you know, we set them up with some parent groups to talk about schools. So we try to go the extra mile in making sure that people can make the leap. Any other comments or questions, Commissioner? All right, thank you very much, Ms. Derby. Did you have any closing comments you want to share with us? Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much, I, and I appreciate your flexibility. I, again, pardon my lack of video, um, but we very much, we feel that Mr. Preston's was, placement, you know, was a five-year tenure, was, is, um, is always a good mark. Um, and that we'd very much appreciate the opportunity to work with you again. Um, but we just appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And I hope that the, you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, Ms. Derby, thank you for joining us on short notice and being with us today. Thank you. All right. We are, sorry, yes, a question from Commissioner Montesino. I have a question, but it's, uh, you know, I'm going to put uh, Guy Preston on the spot. Um, what was your experience? You know, that's one of the, uh, the with um, CPS that we recruited. Um, so I had a good experience with, with CPS HR. I uh, very enjoyed, much enjoyed working with uh, M Derby. Um, I, I thought she was very helpful. Um, she wasn't just um, looking out for what was best for the RTC. She was looking out what was best for the candidate um, so that um, they could provide a good fit. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. All right, we are now going to take item 23. Uh, we will return to item 24 in order to take public comp in order to take public comments on the process of uh, finalizing a recruitment firm. Um, then we will go into a closed session to have any private discussion needed among the commission about hiring a recruitment firm and then come out with our decision at the, uh, after the end of closed session. Hopefully that clarifies it for everyone. I will now be with item 23, Grace Blakesley presenting. Good morning, commissioners. Um, this item, item number 23, is to discuss the agreements for maintenance of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Segment 5, also referred to as the North Coast Rail Trail Project. As part of this item, I will also provide information about the Measure D Active Transportation Program, funding commitments, and remaining capacity. Uh, the North Coast Rail Trail project extends from Wilder Ranch to Davenport. It is, there's a picture of it up on the screen. It's highlighted in red. It will provide a seven and a half mile dedicated bicycle and pedestrian facility along Santa Cruz County's North Coast. Trail construction includes rest areas at viewpoints with interpretive panels, benches, bike racks, trash receptacles, as well as wayfinding signage. The project also constructs two formal parking lots um, that include bathrooms at Davenport and Yellow Bank Panther Peach Beach, and those are shown with red um, boxes and white peas in them on the map. You can see that the segment five connects to the city of Santa Cruz and the other segments of the coastal rail trail vis-a-vis -vis the multi-use path um, along Highway 1 and Caltrans right-of-way, and therefore extending its reach all the way to um, downtown Santa Cruz area and the wharf area. And once other segments are completed, it will extend its reach farther south. Mm -hmm. At your meeting earlier this year in May, you approved, approved entering into funding agreements with the Federal Lands Access Program to fully fund this pro trail project. Since that time, this project has completed final design, and I'm thrilled to report today that we will receive early construction allocation. This project is now scheduled to go out to bid this October, uh, with construction beginning early next year. The construction period is expected to be a two-year length. 
Once segment five is constructed and open to the public, there will be costs associated with maintaining the trail and ensuring a positive user experience. As the project sponsor and per RTC's funding agreement with the Federal Lands Access Program, RTC is responsible for maintenance and operations of segment five and the associated parking lots. In October 2022, I presented you with trail maintenance per mile cost estimates delivered, de developed as a coordinated effort between the RTC, City of Santa Cruz, City of Watsonville, and the County of Santa Cruz staff. Cost per mile for maintenance ranged from 32,000 to 44,000 per year, depending on how long the trail had been in operation. The North Coast Rail Trail Project is located in the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County, and RTC staff has been in conversations with the County of Santa Cruz Parks and Recreation Department and County of Santa Cruz Public Works Department regarding maintenance costs and the option of having the County of Santa Cruz staff perform the required trail and maintenance parking maintenance on behalf of the RTC. RTC and county staff used the previously developed per mile cost estimates as a starting point as, and adjusted those estimates um, to account for a number of unique aspects of segment five, including the number of active farm or rail crossings, uh, the need to remove sand from the trail in certain locations, and the parking lot maintenance, which includes regular maintenance to the restroom. And finally, the number of new trash receptacles and recycling receptacles that will be installed. RTC and county staff asked to estimate the annual cost of maintenance on the North Coast will be approximately 260000 per year and just under 300000 for the first year when there is a one-time expense to purchase a maintenance vehicle dedicated to Segment 5. Maintenance activities will include regular sweeping, vegetation management, litter removal, monthly trail inspections, trash receptacle dumping, graffiti removal, encampment cleanup, comfort station servicing, and signage, fence, bike rack, and bench repairs as needed. The cost estimate does not include um, pavement preservation, which is anticipated to occur between 11 and 20 years after trail operation commences, nor the cost for trail pavement rehabilitation because the need for the significant rehabilitation will likely not occur till after the expiration of Measure D 30 year sales tax in 2047. Next slide. So RTC and County of Santa Cruz staff prepared the draft segment five maintenance agreement that's included in your packet, whereby the County of Santa Cruz would perform maintenance activities as described in the North Coast Rail Trail Maintenance and Operation Plan for a period of five years after it's open to public use. Um, the, as I mentioned, the maintenance agreement is attachment one, exhibit A in the packet, and the trail maintenance and operation plan is um, a referenced in that uh, maintenance agreement. The maintenance and operations plan describes allowable trail uses, patrolling, and how incidents and issues will be addressed. It also describes male trail maintenance activities and their frequencies, how trail closures will be addressed, emergency access, natural resource protection, and the role of the trail manager. It also talks about the regular inspections that will occur to document debris on the trail, trail conditions, erosion, vegetation, trampling, and the condition of the trail amenities and signage. The draft segment five maintenance agreement stipulates that the RTC shall fund 100% of the actual expenditures to implement the trail maintenance and operations plan up to the amount shown in the latest approved Measure D five-year plans, except for the costs associated with graffiti and little removal, which will be paid for by the County of Santa Cruz. The cost sharing works out to be an 80-20 split cost paid for the RTC and County of Santa Cruz. And the current adopted Measure D five-year plan of projects um, provides funding for three years of the Segment 5 trail maintenance. The total estimated cost of the five-year maintenance agreement is $1.3 million, with RTC Measure D active transportation funding providing just over a million. Unlike the proposed draft Segment 5 maintenance agreement, RTC has other existing maintenance agreements with the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Watsonville that I wanted to remind you of. In those instances, the city 
Santa Cruz and City of Watsonville are the project sponsors, not RTC, and they are responsible for trail maintenance. Also, the term of trail maintenance with the agreements uh, with the cities is indefinite with the city of Santa Cruz and has a 30-year time period with the city of Watsonville, so far, far longer than what's being proposed here. In addition, the city of Santa Cruz and Watsonville agree to fund 50% of the anticipated maintenance cost up to the annual programmed amount in the Measure D five-year plan. We have seen recently some of um, the invoices from the cities for the expenditures for fiscal year 2022-23, uh, and they are coming in fairly close to what we've estimated for RTC expenditures, but a, a little bit under. So these are estimates and we'll need to adjust as we have more information. Uh, the County of Santa Cruz staff had re also requested the five-year term to align with the proposed RTC funding commitment and to allow both parties to review the effectiveness of the agreement in the shorter term. So in addition to the segment five maintenance agreement, RTC must enter into an agreement with Caltrans for the portion of the Davenport and Yellow Bank Panther Beach parking lots located in Caltrans right-of-way. This generally includes portions of the parking stalls and the entrance and exits to the parking lot and some of the pedestrian access points. Once the Segment 5 project is constructed, RTC, in coordination with the County of Santa Cruz, will need to continue to coordinate with Caltrans to attain the encroachment permit prior to entering the Caltrans right away. Next slide. Um, although segment five maintenance agreement is a five-year term, there will be an ongoing need for trail maintenance that extends through and beyond the life of Measure D. So as not to oversubscribe Measure D, active transportation category specifically, on the long term, RTC should consider commitments to fund not only the trail maintenance, but potential cost increases on trail projects under development and funds needed to implement additional trail segments, as well as ongoing corridor maintenance. As you know, the Measure D active transportation category receives 17% of the Measure D uh, revenues and is currently, which is currently estimated to generate 178 million over the 30 year life of the tax measure. Next slide, please. So in the staff report, um, I've prepared two tables for you. Um, table one shows a remaining balance of Measure D active transportation funds of 68.3 million based on existing funding commitments. So what's in the approved five-year plan, anticipated corridor maintenance costs over the life of Measure D, so through fiscal year 46-47, and assume financing and debt costs. So this uh, table assumes that the RTC will finance 19.5 million in fiscal year 25-26 at a debt service of 33.3 million. To date, 49 million of those program measure D funds um, have been dedicated to segment five, segment seven, segments eight and nine, segments 10 and 11, and segments 12. In addition, approximately 1 million is already programmed to trail maintenance for those segments that are either constructed or expected to be constructed in that five-year period. And then here you'll see the expected cost of corridor maintenance over the life of Measure D is estimated to be 46 million, um, including the 9 million already expended or program. And I, I think Commissioner Coding mentioned this earlier in um, oral communications, but there is a difference between when I reference the trail maintenance costs and the corridor maintenance costs. Um, corridor maintenance covers costs such as uh, in the rail right away, such as drainage and slope repair maintenance, some of the things you were discussing under I Item eight, whereas trail maintenance is uh, specific to the trail but could include trail drainage. Just want to differentiate that because they could um, be confused. So while over 18 miles of trail are advancing towards construction are completed, pre-construction project development work has not begun to advance another 14 miles of coastal rail trail. And based on planning level estimates of those remaining miles, staff estimates a minimum of 65 million in local funding is needed to leverage state and federal funds. That's assuming a 20% grant match is what we um, typically try to aim for or exceed. Based on expenses and the estimates you see here, um, 
we anticipate that uh, the remaining balance will just barely uh, be a bit, cover that um, $65 million needed in local funding. But it's important to note that this table does not account for the cost um, overrun that may occur on already program projects. Um, and it does not account for ongoing trail maintenance costs beyond uh, what is already programmed in this five-year plan. So table two, ne next slide, please brings that information um, into the analysis and shows that with uh, considering trail maintenance uh, for pro uh, trail maintenance over the life of measure D um, for projects and assuming that trail maintenance begins immediately after the trail operation um, opens for the different segments that the total cost of trail maintenance for the life of Measure D could um, come up to about $30 million per year once all segments are constructed and available for public use. These estimates are per mile cost, not a percentage of trail construction cost. Um, maintenance activities here are assumed to be the same for all segments, but we recognize recognize the cost could vary um, based on how the different segments are constructed, largely related to the cost of drainage um, or maintenance of um, re retaining walls and re graffiti removal. So these is estimates and looking at this table indicate that Measure D Active Transportation Program will ultimately not be able to develop and maintain the remaining trail segments without additional funding or a change in strategy for cooperative funding and maintenance agreements. We are looking today for your input, um, future short-term and long-term programming recommendations and funding strategies, as we are also currently developing the Measure D Strategic Implementation Plan update. So getting your input on this today would be valuable. Nonetheless, a maintenance agreement is one of the last remaining milestones needed to be able to advertise the Segment 5 project for construction, and staff is recommending a five-year maintenance agreement term to address this. While I have focused on Measure D expenses and remaining capacity, I also wanted to take the opportunity to note that Measure D active transportation funds have leveraged over 150 million in other state and federal funds to construct portions of the trails and to advance pre-construction activities. So my last slide is my staff recommendation. And actually, before I go into the staff recommendation, I wanted to thank uh, County of Santa Cruz staff, Rod Tidmores here, who helped with the cost estimates, as well as Jesse Williams, who have gone out on site and looked in detail at what type of maintenance activities we can expect um, on the North Coast. Really appreciate that collaboration. So today there's a number of actions um, staff is recommending. We recommend that you adopt a resolution authorizing the executive director to enter into the maintenance agreement with the Santa County of Santa Cruz to perform trail maintenance for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Segment 5 project. We want we request that you commit to programming funding measure D active transportation funds to the Segment 5 project for the five-year term agreement using the 80-20 cost split mentioned. Also, uh, allow us to enter into a maintenance agreement with the California Department of Transportation that assigns RTC responsible for responsibility for maintenance of the parking lots associated with this project. As I mentioned, we're also seeking your input on pro options for programming funds for trail maintenance in the Measure D Strategic Implementation Plan and to provide direction to continue to um, program funding for corridor and trail maintenance responsibility on a yearly basis as part of our Measure D five-year program updates and to seek additional local funding sources for segment 13 through 20, trail construction and trail maintenance. Thank you. That concludes my report. Very much, Senior Planner Blake Slate. Yeah. Are there comments or questions? Commissioner Rockin. I, I may be in a somewhat unique position in that, unlike the majority, I don't, the commission, I don't represent a city. Um, and I only raise this question, I, I raise it with some trepidation. I'm, I'm happy with this agreement and support it. I'm, I think we should move forward with it. It's exciting, a lot of different ways. But I seek a little bit more transparency about how we come to these agreements about, you know, the city of Wasserville and Santa Cruz are paying 50% of the cost, the county's paying 20, 
I mean, some of this may just be arm twisting and or begging that goes on behind the scenes that can't that there's nothing specific to be said about. But I, I would welcome any kind of comments you could make that would might clarify a little more about. You know, I'm sure the commission. I'm sure that the staff fought for the most we could get for the commission. But anything you can enlighten us with would be very helpful to me to sort of understand how we come to these sort of agreements in the end. The fact that it's five years uh, is comforting to me, and that's why I would support the current recommendation. Um, but five years is going to come up pretty quickly, and then there's the issue of what happens next or where we're going with this. So it's a very open and vague question. Mm -hmm. I mean, limits to what can even be. Maybe it can't be summarized or whatever it can, but that's my question. Yeah, um, well, I, I think you, you you know that we went into it trying to leverage our Measure D funding to the greatest extent possible and partner with our local jurisdictions. Um, and essentially what we heard from the city in, of Watsonville and the city of Santa Cruz is they could um, enter into agreement with the 50-50 cost share and using their local funding sources. And what we heard from the county was that they were not able to provide um, additional resources to meet that funding 50-50 funding commitment. And I do want to recognize that the, the county really understands the, at least from my perspective, the desire to for Measure D to go as far as it possibly can with all of the trail projects. And we appreciate their efforts to um, really look hard at where they could contribute and to contribute the funding for the Little Remover and the Graffiti to get us to that 80-20 split. Follow-up question? I, I could add. Yeah, no, uh, 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 I'll let others do it. Others can do that. Sure. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Kipper Kipper. and then Commissioner Quinn. Yes, it would go to the Board of Supervisors. When we discussed this, we thought it, we'd bring it to the Commission first. It's not sustainable in terms of getting the trail uh, constructed all the way to Watsonville. And so I support this uh, recommendation today because I don't want to hold up the segment five process, which is really a federal process and they're going to move forward and we need to do everything we can to support it. But I do think uh, when it comes to the Board of Supervisors and when it comes to the various city councils, those are the appropriate fora to determine, you know, what the commitment is to the rail trail or to the trail period, and what the commitment is to taking on responsibility for maintaining bike lanes. 
essentially, this is, these are bike lanes. The county maintains bike lanes throughout the county. The city does as well. These are additional bike and pedestrian routes that we all say we need, but if we're making it impossible to achieve them, I think we're not following through on that commitment. So again, those are my comments. And I want to hear from the public, but I do intend to support the staff record. Thank you, Commissioner Schiffer and Commissioner Quinn. My comments follow up on Commissioner Schiffer's and being from Aptos, it's pretty discouraging, if I'm understanding this correctly, that the segment of the trail ending at Rio Del Mar is construction funded and maintenance funded, and everything south of Rio Del Mar is up in the air, we're out of money. That's the message to the public. It's not a great message. Other comments or questions from commissioners? I will tack on a comment here to address some of the points raised by Commissioner Schifrin. I mean, I think, especially as a county representative, we ought to acknowledge the extreme financial hardships that the county is facing. Less than 10% of our total budget in reserves right now. That's dangerously low. Meanwhile, we have $130 million in emergency repairs we're trying to do throughout the community because of the 2023 storms. On top of close to a billion dollars in deferred maintenance between culverts that need repair and resurfacing projects on top of consistently getting less than our population-based share of state and federal monies to repair county roads. I mean, believe me, I would love to direct more county funds towards this project, but we can't sit here and design the limousine of trails and then say that, oh, in order to build this thing, we need to take money away from someone's only access to and from their home. That is just not responsible. And so again, I mean, let's have the conversation with the Board of Supervisors. I think there's a representative of every board member here, but um, we cannot take money away from county roads, from people's lifeline to and from their home uh, and put it on the trail. So I think, I'm sorry to say, I think it's the best that we can probably do for that. I'll just make a quick comment here. I do represent one of those jurisdictions, not the county, uh, the city of Santa Cruz. And I have advocated strongly for city to uh, utilize the, the funding that um, we also benefit from, the Measure D funding to help support uh, this maintenance. And, um, you know, while I'm uh, glad to see that we've achieved a 50 50 split, I actually believe that uh, we have a responsibility to um do better in the long run um and uh so I, i'm not going to speak to the county's fiscal situation and the trade-offs there but I, I do think that it's important that we think about um the rtc uh has very limited resources we we do not uh, and i recognize that's true for the county and for all jurisdictions but we are trying to build uh you know a, a trail along the entire length of this uh, rail corridor, and we want to be able to uh, address the parts of the trail that haven't been developed. And it's, I think it's an equity question as well for South County. Um, so, you know, I, I want to see the local jurisdictions put in as much as possible on these uh, agreements uh, moving forward. And I'm going to support, uh, again, after hearing from the, the public, um, I, I intend to support this. I'm glad it's a five-year agreement and that we'll have an opportunity to um, continue this conversation. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. No other yeah. comments? Yeah, like everything else, uh, it gets down to money and what's what's reality, what we can do. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be supportive of this plan because I think this is what uh, people want. And I think this is what we should do. But uh let's get real this is uh we're we're uh, rolling the dice on this and that's not uh to uh to criticize any of this recommendation because i think it's the right one this is what we want to do but in reality with what we're facing in transportation uh, requirements and needs that we have in this county uh we ought to recognize this is going to be very difficult pain but um I don't think we should back away from it either. I think we should have a plan of attack as presented and a very good one. But um, this was mentioned by 
by Chair Koenig, um, we, we have so many needs that we're facing in this county that uh, we're going to try to match, and it's going to be difficult to be so dependent on other sources of funding to the Santa Cruz County. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. So now there are comments or questions from commissioners. I'll open it up to the public. Hi, I'm Sally Arnold. I'm representing Friends of the Rail and Trail. I'm very excited to hear about the uh, accelerated pace of construction for Segment 5. I'm really happy. That's just very exciting. Um, we support making sure that these maintenance agreements can move forward. So this may, We support this maintenance agreement so that we can move forward with trail construction for Segment 5. Um, and we do appreciate that the staff report mentions the need for care when negotiating these agreements. So we don't use as some people have mentioned, all our Major D money, maintaining the bits of trail we have, and then we don't have money to do a future match for future trail construction, including the trails that would connect Aptos to Watsonville. And so we appreciate that some people are talking about how are we gonna think about this in the long term? How are we gonna create a sustainable uh, flow here? And we uh, do uh, support the suggestions made by commissioners Schifford and Brown, that the local jurisdictions uh, look at this as just like they re re maintain other asphalt in their jurisdiction. This is a strip of asphalt that needs, you know, cleaning up too, and it should be maintained by the jurisdictions. The um, I was excited to see that um, in the presentation, something about seeking additional funds for, you know, for this kind of work, and particularly what kind of funds might be available for not just the trail maintenance, but the corridor maintenance, kind of hearkening back to item eight earlier. And so um, would really uh, love to see us using Major D money to leverage outside money to come in for maintaining the corridor as well as the trail. And, um, you know, for uh, people who I'm sure we're gonna hear um, oppose the trail, uh, we need to remember that these maintenance costs are independent of whether or not there are tracks beside it. Thank you. Arnold. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Rob Tidmore. I'm a park planner for Santa Cruz County Parks. I'm also the project manager for the county's segment 1011 project and our uh, our portion of the segment 8 and 9 project. Um, obviously, just want to acknowledge, you know, hearing the comments from various commissioners, the this is a very challenging issue funding, you know, both the construction and the maintenance of the trail. And um, I want to thank Grace. Um, we worked long and hard on this agreement. Um, it's hard to estimate costs for something that hasn't been built. Um, and we put a lot of time and effort into it. And we feel like the county feels like in particular, this is a mutually agreeable solution to cover the cost of maintenance, um, both county parks and the community development and infrastructure, formerly public works, are supportive of taking on this maintenance of the North Coast Rail Trail. And as uh, other commissioners have mentioned, you know, the county has very challenge, you know, major challenges with our with our budget and our funding. You know, our pavement condition index is at 48. Um, we have storm damage previously that we haven't been able to fix with, with the parks department. And, you know, adding the cost of this rail trail maintenance, which which is significant. I, I won't deny that. Um, to our already stretched budgets is just not sustainable from the county's budget standpoint. Um, we've searched for funds and 20% is the best that we can do. Um, I know equity has been mentioned um, in terms of funding the rest of the, the trail segments and we absolutely support that, but we also have an equity commitment to make as well. Our, our recent strategic plan update um, added an equity goal to uh, the existing four goals in the plan. And we can't in good conscience take money that would be used for maintenance and improvement of, of parks in South County and move it up to, to um, use for rail trail maintenance on, on the North Coast. So we are, um, you know, we're committed to collaboratively working with the RTC uh, towards completion of this. Uh, we recommend approval of the staff recommendation and uh, we look forward to, you know, more of a discussion on this topic at uh, a future Board of Supervisors meeting. Thank you. Mr. Tidmore. Else here in 
chambers. Is there anyone online that wishes to speak? Van Brink. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, yeah, it's uh, of course uh, slightly. Uh, hi, I'm David Van Brink. I live in Santa Cruz City. Um, it's uh, you know, of course, slightly unsurprising that uh, certain of the self-proclaimed uh, trail creation advocates are, as usual, acting to maximally obstruct trail creation. Um, but that aside, uh, wow, the North Coast Trail is going to be a very popular feature here in our uh, beautiful coastal town. Uh, I support trail creation, and uh, of course, please, please move forward with this. Thanks. Mr. Scott? Yes, hello, thank you. This is Barry Scott in Rio Del Mar and I'm, uh, and I'm uh, happy uh, to, to uh, express my support for this, uh, for this, this plan for maintenance. Uh, I really wanna see the, the North Coast uh, Trail open. It's a multi-agency uh, project that uh, is, is gonna be of great value and benefit to the community. Uh, to to those concerns, and they're not unreasonable concerns that um, funds are are stretched thin. I want to remind uh, everyone that that uh, our RTC, our, our grant writers, and our, 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 our the whole program have have uh, benefited from significant grants. And I know that one doesn't want to count their chickens before they hatch, but uh, for all the for the measure D funds they, they, that can match grants, I think we have a lot of opportunity there. And uh, so I, I always want to thank the uh, the grant writers for their their work in getting these remarkable uh, grants. The mega grant for the the multimodal project in Aptos, the the, the record setting large grants in December for trail work, and uh, just a final thought. Remember that. Um, I believe a lot of the grants have been coming in because our rail trail is a multimodal uh, facility with, with railroad tracks being studied for transit and the trail together. So um, I'm confident that we're going to be able to, to complete the entire rail trail with the tracks and uh, that we'll find ways to, to uh, maintain, maintain the corridor. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Commissioner Aurelio Gonzalez. All right, can you hear me? You can. All right. Um, yeah, I'm supportive of this, of this, the South County uh, resident. I think this is a great opportunity for our county um, to move forward on this project for the trail. I think it'll, it'll bring in uh, a lot of needed uh, uh, revenue by the tourist attractions that it'll, it'll, it'll bring. Uh, and people using this segment of the trail. Also, it'll help our community, even though they say we're a disadvantaged community. I think we're in a, a community that is um, diverse and uh, seek opportunities to look for recreational opportunities within our county and not have to travel outside our county to to see these wonderful sites that, that are within our, our region. So I'm in total support of this um, and, I, and I hope we move forward. And as far as the segment for the city of Watsonville, our segment has been completed uh, as far as our boundaries go for our trail. So we're not going to uh, increase in cost uh, for the trail maintenance. Uh, the, the remaining sections that do exist for the trail to connect us uh, throughout the through fair would fall in the county. And, and I know how uh, restricted the money is now. But again, we're looking into the future and hopefully the future will be brighter for our county and uh, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, former Commissioner Gonzalez. Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Chair Koenig. Um, I do support the uh, motion of the number 23 for the segment five. Um, some other areas possibility for funding. I know the money's short and it is a shame they not, cannot continue past uh, 
the uh, Sumner area or the Rio del Mar section for Aptos. I live just up the hill from that. Um, have we looked into, well, first of all, taxes. You look to Europe, you look to other countries. How are they building these mass transit uh, type situations or projects? It's tax money and it's government involved and that's where they put their money. Uh, basically, you could add a property tax or jurisdiction share of taxes for each part of the trail that runs through certain areas. Uh, there's also conservancy donations or private donations for those uh, that can afford to do something like that. Uh, you could also have highway user fees go towards the rail and trail project. Uh, and Carlsbad, California has presently passed a gas tax fund to fund their rail trail project and you can also go to federal uh, gas taxes as well as part of the funding for the rail trail. Just some suggestions, uh, maybe something that you could look into in the future. Thank you for your time. Okay. No further hands raised online, I'll return to the commission for action. With the staff recommendation. Yeah, of course, yes, we, we do have a- Can I just ask a question and follow up? Of course, Commissioner Quinn. Um, I'll, I'm, I am torn on this because I recognize that building a trail and not maintaining it is crazy. But I, I really worry how much will committing all the funds handcuff us on trying to secure funds for south of Rio Del Mar? Good question. Um, so right now the agreement before you is for a five-year period. So you're not committing the funds beyond a five-year period. That table two that I showed you is what it would be um, estimated to cost once all the segments are online. So from a precedent set setting standpoint, you could say that you're committing the funds, but from a programming and um, you know the commission action today, you're committing just to a five-year uh, program. That's your question. And if I can elaborate a little bit, um, I mean, your commission is correct in, in showing their concern about remaining capacity to, to finish the trail and maintain them. Um, I'm very pleased to hear the comments that I've heard so far that they're supporting this agreement because I think it's very important to get this segment of trail um, uh, under construction and have a way to maintain it for at least the first five years. But if you looked at the numbers closely that we presented to you, we think we're gonna need about what we have in remaining capacity with us just committed to a five year period of time to complete the remaining trails. Now, when you talk about remaining capacity, you're talking about the lifetime of the program until 2047. We're tapped out over the next five years. So we don't have any of that capacity today or tomorrow, we won't have any capacity until about 2028, 2029. And it'll start slowly building up until we get to 2047. We also have to fund potentially any cost overruns on the projects that are currently under development. We've been talking closely with our partners and they are concerned about cost overruns. We've met, we've talked about value engineering because they think they're going to need additional funding to complete the sections that are moving forward. So even if we are successful in obtaining a better agreement with the county and the cities, this is not sustainable. We do not have enough funding to leverage the remaining trail segments that would complete the full 32 mile Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail along the rail line. Um, we need to all be aware of that and need to be aware of what we will need to do to be able to complete all 32 miles. Um, I've heard a lot of comments about how successful we have been in getting grants. We've been successful in getting grants because we've had money available in present years to leverage those grant opportunities. We also, I've also heard that we could leverage money for, for maintenance. Well, generally speaking, maintenance is funded from local funds. That there, there aren't grant opportunities for maintaining sections of trail. So that's really not an option. So if you really are looking at completing the full 32 mile 
coastal rail trail, we need to start considering an additional local fund source. So we'll have additional capacity to leverage the remaining sections of the trail. Um, we should be wide-eyed and aware of this as we move forward. Um, but there are other um, transportation needs that we have in this county that we've also been talking about, including the rail line and, you know, a future rail project on the rail line. And um, that is going to require local funding moving forward as well. So we've talked if we could somehow combine these projects, the remaining uh, miles of trail that still aren't funded with the rail line and pose something in the future to the voters so that we can fund the remaining trail and also provide a rail facility. But that would be an additional revenue source and it would have to be approved by the voters. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to create a doomsday scenario at the same time that we're celebrating the fact that we've got about half of the trail funded and we could maintain it. But I also want the commission to be aware that we are going to need additional funding to complete the trail. Thank you, Director Preston. And one uh, point of clarification, I, I'm, I'm aware we have a motion from Commissioner Schiffer and a second from Commissioner Rodkin on the floor uh, to accept the recommendation. Um, item three, or, or the third staff recommendation is to continue to prudently program funding for corridor and trail maintenance responsibilities on a yearly basis. It's that simply you know, by agreeing to this recommendation as the commission today simply saying that generally agree with this, including this $30 million uh, line item for trail maintenance in future measure B planning. Include trail maintenance funding or not. So you're not committing to it. The, the commitment is to request to commit to the five-year term for this segment five, but for other maintenance um, every year. Gotcha. Thank you. Commissioner Hernandez? I, you know, I just had some quick comments. Uh, you know, I, I, everyone knows I support the rail, but I, I very much support the trail as well. Uh, and I just wanted to say a little bit about funding with the county. You know, we have a tremendous amount of uh, roads with the county, uh, both, you know, rural and from North County to South County. And we only, not only have to address a lot of the uh, deferred maintenance on our roads, but also with the recent fires and flood damage that we've recently had uh, that we have to address. And, you know, one of the things that I've brought up is that we also have to bring up a lot of equity issues with our roads, uh, which is a recent, recent thing that some counties are talking about, like, uh, Alameda and uh, Marin County. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that I very much support this. And I think when it comes to South County, I, I want to make sure that we do pursue active transportation grants, um, you know, talk to folks like the Strategic Growth Council that have funds for trails as well. They're looking at funds for trails right now in South County. Um, but I would want a great, you know, partnership with uh, any city that would want a partial partnership to get these grant opportunities. Uh, I think it behooves cities, counties, RTP, that we partnership for, for these grant opportunities. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. I'll just add, and of course, I'm very much in support of the recommendations here uh, as well today. I don't want my previous comments to suggest otherwise. It's simply that... Um, Saying that the county is in a tough spot. A lot of the comments that I hear from constituents every day are around maintenance. So uh, whether it's maintenance of our county roads or maintenance of our parks, I very much appreciate that this uh, this agency is taking a responsible uh, outlook on ensuring that we have enough funds to maintain this facility that we build. That is um, absolutely the best thing to do. Glad we've got an agreement uh, here today that we can live with for five years. I'm um, very excited to see the North Coast segment. Further comments? Uh, again, we have a motion from Commissioner Schiffer and second from Commissioner Rotkin. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? It's aye. No. One no from Commissioner Quinn. Any abstentions? That motion passes uh, 11 to 1.
All right, thank you again, uh, Senior Planner Blasley. We'll now proceed with item 24. Uh, this is a continuation of uh, the process to consider and approve contract and uh, with a recruiting firm for executive director recruitment services. Uh, we did hear interviews with the two leading candidates earlier today. Um, there is an opportunity for other further comments from commissioners. I'm seeing anyone raise their hand. So there's an opportunity for the uh, public to comment on anything that they heard earlier today or they would like the commission to consider as we consider uh, the applications. No one here in chambers, no one online. Then uh, the commission will now move into closed session to uh, have an opportunity to discuss the application, and then we will uh, return into open session to make any decisions. Thank you. Chair Koenig, we're on item 24, which is the selection of the recruiter. Um, the, the commission has the two firms that you interviewed this morning. Um, it would be appropriate for the commission to make a motion identifying the firm to, to select, authorizing the executive, sorry, authorizing the chairperson to sign the proposed price. Thank you, counsel. Do we have a motion? Uh, I'll make the motion. Um, I'll move CPS as a recruiter. Second, motion by Commissioner Montesino, second by Commissioner Schifrin to approve CPS as our executive recruiter. Further discussion? None. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Just for the record, there was no portable. That brings us to the end of our meeting today. Thank you for joining. Adjourned. Thank you.